Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. We are buzzing as always, coming in hot, recording from my parents' house today. That's why we got the different mic and the different background, doing a bit of house sitting. And today we have another Toronto lad, well, ex-Toronto lad, still a Toronto lad at heart on the show. Today we have Mike Silagadze, founder and CEO of EtherFi, the first decentralized delegated staking protocol that allows stakers to maintain full control of their keys and by extension, their staked ETH throughout the entire staking process. Prior to founding EtherFi, Mike was CEO and co-founder of Top Hat, which he grew into the market leader in student engagement software with 500 employees and 60 mil in annual revenue. Funny story, I used to use Top Hat when I was in uni as well. So shout out Mike and the team for making that. It was actually pretty darn fun and made class a lot more fun. Mike is also an active speaker and lecturer in the higher education technology and startup communities, having lectured at the Rutman Commerce Entrepreneurship Organization, the ASU GSV Summit, Mars, TechFest Toronto, SAS North, and TEDx Laurier University, among many others. It's been a hot minute, finally pumped, super pumped to have you on. Mike, welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's definitely a blast from the past. I feel like Canada was a different life. But uh, yeah, no, great, great to be here. Pumped to have you on, Mike. Pumped to have you on. Let's start with good old Top Hat. And just for a bit of the uh, bit of context for the listeners here, Top Hat is a student engagement software that really just made class much more fun, whereas everyone was just sort of, you know, going through the motions and on Instagram at their phones or trying to find the new hot thing on Tinder or whatever the case may be during class. Mike and his squad made class a little bit more fun, engaging sort of Q&As and um, a bunch of other fun stuff like that. My question to you, Mike, firstly, why did you start Top Hat? And secondly, I'd love if you could give us some stories that helped you and the team scale to 500 employees and 60 mil in annual rev. Yeah, so, you know, I started Top Hat pretty much uh, right out of undergrad. And like a lot of good startups, uh, good companies, the interest in the space and the, and the problem that we were trying to solve really just grew out of my experience. In many ways, I was just solving a problem that I uh, uh, had when I was a, a university student. Um, you know, I found university was kind of this odd environment where everybody was there sort of for the wrong reasons, in a sense. You know, students were, most students were just there at a party, learning or the actual educational aspect of it was kind of secondary. And then you had professors that were really only interested in research, but they were kind of tasked with teaching courses. So it created this really strange kind of environment. Uh, and I thought, hey, can we actually make courses, lessons, content more engaging so that students could uh, get more value out of it and so that uh, professors would uh, would enjoy teaching? Um, and you know, in starting that, that company pretty much made every mistake you can think of from building the wrong product, picking the wrong customer, picking the wrong investors and the early days. And, uh, you know, it was a wild ride. I think that company sort of was willed into existence in probably one of the hardest markets that you could go after, which is higher ed. I feel like I spend a good amount of my time talking to uh, potential ed tech entrepreneurs, telling them not to go into education <laughs> technology because of how just you know, some of the things I just mentioned, weird incentives. and Too much red tape, right? First and foremost. Yeah. It's just broken on, in a lot of levels. Uh, just a, a lot of different things kind of fundamentally don't don't work. So it just makes it really hard to build a business. What about like things you would have done differently? Obviously, this is not your, you know, EtherFi is not your your first, second or third kick out the can here, but really just lessons, non-obvious things perhaps that, you know, your, your, your first time as a founder growing and turning that into a very established company, things you perhaps wish you would have known at the time. I think that's a good place to start just because, again, that's, those are things, you know, what's the famous quote in life? You'd always rather learn from others than go through the pain and hardship yourself. Like what lessons sure. would you pass along to someone like me who wants to start something in the ed tech space or just any startup for that matter? The first thing I would say is, look, most people are shouldn't be starting companies. Doing a startup is a really, really bad idea. Even joining a startup generally is a really bad idea for probably 99% of people or, or whatever the ratio is. Because the risk reward, I mean, the fundamental sort of equation doesn't make sense for most people. If you're looking for just a, a steady, comfortable income and an ability to, to have some separation between your work and, and your life uh, and some predictability and, and, and frankly, even if you want to make a lot of money, doing a startup is not that. That's the worst thing to be doing. Those are your, uh, your motivations. Um, 
So I, I think um, that's the first thing that I, I often tell kind of would-be entrepreneurs is like really ask yourself if you want to do it. And nobody ever does. Nobody ever actually like takes a pause and, and you know, assesses whether they, uh, they're they actually looking to get into it. Because, you know, a startup will take, if you're doing it properly, a startup will take over your life. And a startup is also not just like starting a business because there's lots of businesses, right? You can do a franchise. You can, there's lots of, you can do a landscaping business. It, you can do lots of different types of businesses. A startup is a very particular type of business that's usually technology enabled and designed to grow really, really fast. And, and that introduces a tremendous amount of risk. Uh, it introduces a certain funding model that I think, uh, you know, works pretty well for, for startups. Um, uh, it introduces a, a, a tremendous amount of pressure and uh, kind of volatility to the the experience. Um, and that's just kind of a wild ride. And it, as I said, for most people, if you just do the math of like, I don't know, what's your expected value of doing a startup? It really doesn't make any sense. You're way better off. Just go be an engineer at, you know, at Google or something, you know, semi-retirement, uh, get paid tons of money and, you know, call it a day. Like that's that's actually a really good way to go if you're just looking to make a bunch of money. So that's probably the first thing. The, the second thing is, okay, so for the crazy, almost in a literal sense, the crazy people that do want, uh, that are the right fit and it, for some reason just are uh, obsessed with the, this idea of doing their own startup, the right approach is to just find a problem that you're so passionate about that you can't, you almost can't help yourself. Like you have to solve it. Like it just takes over your life uh, in a sense uh, or your, your mental space. Um so that you're so passionate about it that when you're going through all the insanity of uh, of a startup, it's worth it. Uh, yeah, like it, it it pushes through. Uh, it helps you push through um, the craziness. You know, um, another piece of advice, uh, and there's again, there's a million things. Is being very careful with co-founders. You know, I'll often uh, meet folks who are asking, like, how do I find a co-founder? And it's almost like if you're asking that question, you're already in trouble because. The, your co-founder needs to be somebody that you've already been in trenches with. So true. The odds that you can pick a, a random person and it'll just work out are like basically zero. So you you almost want to put yourself, I mean, this is why university is actually a good place to find co-founders because you you know, you know get the opportunity to go through the, the grinder with a bunch of different people and uh, you get a feel like who, who are the people that you want to you wanna work with. So that's an important thing. So don't find a co-founder, just... Find somebody that you've worked with uh, who also wants to start a company and and uh, and try to make a go uh, at that. I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll pause there. I mean, there's a million things. No, I know those are great. Well, one thing that that I find really interesting, and hopefully that hopefully one day I have to deal with this problem. This is the problem of starting your startup, the founding moment where you have your first five hires. You now have you, your co-founder, and five. You're a team of seven. And then you hire another 20. And then you hired a 50. And then 100. And then 200. And you guys were all the way up to multiple hundreds. What's the psychological change like from really being in the weeds the whole time and then changing to pretty much just managing people. I'm sure you're still in the weeds in some capacity, but like mm -hmm. at what number employee does the whole sort of playbook change from I'm in the weeds, I'm working on absolutely everything from now just now I'm hiring and fielding and motivating the best people possible to then motivate their teams to move the needle. At what sort of number employee does that whole shift change? You're exactly right that it does, you know, it changes dramatically. Uh, and there's different dividing lines, sort of different stages, I guess. Um, it's somewhat arbitrary, but there's definitely the zero to five person stage where the founders, I mean, there's two or three of them at that point, you know, are doing everything. The founder, yeah. are literally, you're writing, in my case, you know, I'm writing code, I'm going on customer calls. I'm, I mean, just everything, every aspect of the company, you're doing it. Once you get to around... 10 to 15 people, things things change because now you're not doing everything. Now you're yeah. you're still aware of everything. I mean, maybe I'll caveat, there are different kinds of founders and I'm a very operationally minded, you know, founder. I, I, I like to get involved, I, I do stuff. There's different, there's different types of folks out there. So yeah, so at the 10 to 15 person stage, it changes where, because you're, you're aware of everything that's happening. You're aware of what everybody is working on but you're not the one doing it. And there's like some division of responsibility that uh, that comes into, into play. Um, and then the, the next stage usually is around like 30 to 40 people 
there's a change there because now you're you're no longer kind of directly touching everybody. Instead, you're you're working through managers. So now you're managing managers who are yeah. managing people. You've got a management team. You need yeah. a planning structure, cadence, like the, the, all that stuff actually starts mattering a lot. Operational excellence really starts to differentiate between you know well run and you know poorly run companies. The next stage is probably about 150, where like the next layer of abstraction kind of takes place because now you're managing managers or managing managers. And then 500, there's basically the spectrum is from person who's basically doing the work. The the spectrum, the journey is from person who's doing the work to by the end of it, you're really almost like resembling much more of a sort of a politician. (laughs) Um, uh, You know, where your role is much more influence and uh, alignment and setting the vision, very high level kind of strategic uh, directions. But even even that being said, I would say um, this is an opinion that probably a lot of people would disagree with, but I, so I'll caveat that with that. But um, the best founders that I know are surprisingly in the weeds, even at pretty large scale. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, I interviewed and approved every single hire that we made up to probably around when we were 300 people. Jeez. And then, uh, you know, I didn't interview every single person, but I, you know, I had some, I obviously, you know, uh, had an awareness and, and, and sign off. Uh, I've known people that have done that up to even larger uh, scales. And that's a particular sort of point because I think hiring is certainly as you get bigger, the most important thing, uh, you know, keeping talent density high uh, yeah. and keeping the bar for talent high is, is the most important thing that you can do. Literally nothing else matters if you surround yourself with bozos. I mean, it's just, it's, so there's true. no way to make that work. So there's a reason why founders tend to stay involved in that into a pretty large uh, scale. Even though the role changes pretty dramatically and it's much more focused on kind of abstract high level leadership, you still have to be in the weeds. Most founders have like one, you know, maybe they're like really product focused or maybe they're, uh, business or financially focused and, you know, there's sort of one rail on which they tend to, you know, stay really, really deep uh, in the, uh, in the weeds. hundred percent. I love that. Let's, let's get into crypto. This is a crypto pod here. Although I wish I could, uh, I wish I could have you for a couple hours just on the startup stuff, but that'll be for the next show we do. Crypto, why did you make the jump? I, I just, just by looking at you and just by hearing you talk, I could tell that you were grinding away at Top Hat and, you know, on, on your spare time, you were probably messing around with, you know, crypto initiatives here and there, new protocols, ETH stake in the whole nine yards. But why the jump from Top Hat over to Etherfy? Yeah, so uh, th- that's a great question. And it wasn't, in some ways, it wasn't actually much of a jump because I'd been dabbling in crypto. I guess it was sort of a side project yeah. from pretty much the very beginning. I mean, I, I bought a few Bitcoin back in uh, 2011. Wow. This was before there were even exchanges. I, it was like less than a dollar per Bitcoin or whatever it was trading at. Uh, there weren't even exchanges. I mean, you I, met some guy at Eaton Center, <laughs> traded him a couple of Big Macs for, for a Bitcoin. It was almost even more kind of sketchy than that. It was just a random guy <laughs> in a forum. Uh, I just, he was selling Bitcoin. I PayPal him some money, 20 bucks, and he sent me 20 Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, cool. This is neat. And then I played around with mining. I kind of, just messed around with it. Um, and I, I kind of was of two minds about the crypto space. On the one hand, I got very excited about it right away. The idea, I mean, this is cliche in crypto land now, but the idea of a stateless currency is remarkable. And I, to this day, I'm like, the, the this is the most important thing that I think can happen, I guess, in, you know, the end game here, I, th- I think, is a new layer of abstraction on top of nation states. Like countries kind of stop mattering that much. And instead... These meta organizations, I think, uh, you know, Balaji talks about it, like the yeah. the network state. Uh, network there's state, a variety yeah. of these types of concepts. Uh, I think that's the end game, and that, that's a really big deal. I mean, that is like kind of you know, we went from tribes to kingdoms to you know uh, to I guess constitutional republics. Yeah, these were pretty big shifts. Uh, I think this is another one, and I think it's going to happen in the next twenty to thirty years. So that that got me really excited right away. But it was all gambling and scams and bullshit for like a decade, you know, pretty much from 2010 until like, I don't know, until today, honestly, for the most part. Uh, It's just gambling. It's just giant decentralized casinos 
There was this, you know, a lawsuit by the SEC uh, against Coinbase. They're selling you know, our unregistered securities. You know, yesterday they announced uh, action against Binance. And it's almost, it's so absurd because these are casinos. Like, what are you talking about? If you should be going after them, you should be going after them for running a casino without a license. Uh, what, these are not securities in any meaningful sense. It just from the standpoint, there's no value creation. It's just like, these are just gamble tokens. Like these are Pokemon cards. Like it doesn't matter what they are. So that's why I didn't get into it earlier because I'm like, I don't really care about gambling. I don't want to run a casino. ICOs and Ethereum, I got super excited about Ethereum because the idea of like Turing complete uh, language, you know, instead of Bitcoin script, which is, you know, very yeah. limited deliberately. I got super excited about that. But like nothing was happening. It was just gambling. Until like around 2019, 2020, the first like real protocols started to emerge. The first DeFi products, like actual software being written on the blockchain uh, started to emerge. And that to me was like the holy shit moment. Like, okay, now it's real. It's still 95% gambling, but like there's a 5% sliver of reality and that's going to encompass the whole thing. Probably fairly soon. Uh, like, I don't think it's going to be that long, especially with interest rates kind of like sucking the oxygen out of the most gambling elements uh, of it. I think we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, reality sort of entering the space. That's what made me make the shift. That was part of the, a big part of the motivation to um, transition ownership to exit top hat to a private equity fund and step back and switch gears into crypto. It was seeing the emergence of the first real products, uh, you know, in the uh, in the space. And that was it. I love that. Folks, got to take a quick break and give a massive shout out to our sponsor of the show, and that is Prime XBT. And when we get back, we are going to get right into the weeds about EtherFi and everything restaking related. Until then, huge shout out to Prime XBT, our sponsor of the show, longtime friends of CryptoNews.com. Prime XBT offers a robust trading system for both beginners and professional traders. Doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a vet, you can easily design and customize your layouts and widgets to best fit your trading style. Prime XBT is also running an exclusive promo for listeners of the Crypto News podcast. The promo code is Crypto News 50. That is Crypto News 50, all one word, to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. That is Crypto News 50 to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. And now back to the show with Mike. Mike, before we jump in to the nitty gritty stuff, I'm going to throw the ball over to your end of the court. Give the listeners a quick TLDR on EtherFi, what you and the team are doing over there and what you guys are building. Yeah, so maybe I'll start actually with how we settled on this particular problem uh, set. Uh, so at the highest level, EtherFi is a decentralized staking protocol. The reason that we decided to go into this category was because we started and we're running a an ETH staking fund, basically a hedge fund for people to be able to, you know, invest their dollars in their ETH, and then we would uh, we would stake it and then use some DeFi strategies to uh, boost yields. Um, now, when we started doing that, we evaluated all the different you know options that were available out there for staking. And fairly quickly realized that there actually wasn't anything that we were comfortable with using ourselves. I mean, we basically everything that we saw involved on some level giving up custody of our ETH. Uh, in particular, anything in DeFi, anything that was smart contract defied, was basically custodial, and uh, we didn't feel comfortable with that. We didn't think it was worth, you know, for the four or five percent yield that we were getting. It, it just wasn't worth the losing custody of the ETH. Um, and we, we think that Ethereum staking is this sort of foundational good that is essential and has to exist and has to be decentralized. I mean, it, it is terrifying the amount of concentration that we see in this space because I think there are many vulnerabilities, many of which are sort of widely known, that could lead to, you know, really bad outcomes and, you know, potentially as much as a third of it, ETH, uh, staked ETH, uh, you know, being, uh, being put at risk. So we felt like there was room for another category. In, in particular, we were excited by the uh, prospect of uh, restaking because we felt like that was an opportunity to uh, uh, sort of expand the scope of Ethereum and, and increase uh, overall yields. So that's you know something that we were very interested in uh, as well. And so, so we decided to build a product that we ourselves would use as, as part of the the fund, and then. As the more we got into it, the more we realized, all right, we actually want to double down on this and make this our primary and uh, and only focus. Um, 
So that's how EtherFi was born. And again, as a summary, it is a liquid staking protocol. So users can stake their ETH while retaining their keys, their actual keys. The reason that's important is because it means that if the protocol gets hacked or if the node operators misbehave or you know the SEC comes knocking, you don't care. It doesn't matter. As a user, you have your keys, you have access to your crypto, you can just get your ETH uh, back, which I think is uh, is important. And periodically, every time there's a blow up, people get reminded of that. So that's that's one difference in EtherFi. And the second difference is that it is designed to be extensible. It is designed to be built upon. And that's where restaking and various other interesting uh, projects uh, come in. We are actually going to be launching a really exciting kind of gamification layer on top of uh, EtherFi called EtherFan. And EtherFan is you could think of it as an NFT project where the NFT is backed by staked ETH. So it's the first NFT that pays you. Because when you buy the, the NFT, you are buying staked ETH. Uh, or when you mint an NFT, you're minting it with, with staked ETH, which then occurs value, which then you know uh, accrues staking rewards as the, uh, you know, the staked ETH generates returns. So, um, uh, and then there's a, a number of other really interesting kind of gamification layers and the loyalty and membership uh, program built on top of it. So that's ether.fan, uh, and that's going to be launching on uh, Friday, June uh, June 9th. So by the time this comes out on Monday the 12th, um, Etherfan will be locked and loaded. So for all the listeners, by the time this episode is live, uh, obviously go check out ether.fan. I love how you guys are so clean with the domains as well. Ether.fi, ether.fan, it's just, it's nice. You know, on the user, it's so simple to put in. But I'd love to jump on the topic of self-custody. And I know you and the team are very big believers in the importance of self-custody in Ether staking, other existing liquid staking platforms like Lido by Lido Lido are, you know, aren't really decentralized. And it truly is a pretty sizable threat, um, especially after Shanghai. But I feel like most of us aren't too cognizant of this problem. I'd love if you could take a deep dive into this and let us know, you know, more about the importance of self-custody in Ether staking. Yeah, I mean, I'll start maybe by uh, talking about the positive things about Lido. I mean, Rocket Pool also is uh, uh, another staking protocol that I'm a, a huge fan of, and I think they're they're tremendously focused on decentralization from the bottom up. Lido, I think, um, had the fortune and misfortune fortune of launching first, and when you're first, you you get to basically make all the mistakes that everybody in the peanut gallery gets to kind of complain about. But I think they actually, in some ways, Lido actually helped uh, decentralization. In particular, I think they validated the need and um, the opportunity around liquid staking. I mean, prior to that, I think there were a lot of people that were skeptical that it was even going to work or it was a good idea. So uh, Lido, I think, proved that model out. And the second thing is, look, if you didn't have Lido and all this ETH staked in, in Lido, like where would that ETH be? I mean, it would be in Binance and Coinbase and you know, formerly Touché. Kraken. And is that much better? You know, like, it, would you really want like Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance, like basically having control of the, the network? I, I don't know. That that seems worse, actually. So for all the challenges of Lido, um, you know, they they were first, they proved it out, and they they brought more on-chain staking to Ethereum. Now, the challenges obviously uh, are for sure there, and I think they're working on it. You know, they recently released... Uh, uh, what they call a staking router, which allows them to sort of bring in solo stakers or solo node operators, which I think is an important step uh, forward. But um, the biggest fear I have with Lido is that it is sort of like an, uh, you know, one of N security model, which is say like any one of 30 node operators blows up. And I think it takes the whole thing down because you don't need to be uncertain about uh, all of them. You just need to be uncertain about one so and then true. suddenly, you know, the liquidity around stake ETH, SDE, um, very quickly disappears and it leads to the whole protocol kind of getting potentially locked up. So that's my fear. And, you you know, they have node operators that are based in the U.S. So I just worry about that. That's what it keeps me up at night. If you, if you have like one of those 30 node operators misbehave, it could lead to really bad things uh, happening. Are there any non-obvious sort of pros in regards to having much more singular, and by singular, I mean, you know, one person entity, a single human stakers versus the 
massive corpse and just early people that got in? Like what, besides obviously just more decentralization and, and less hardship points, any other non-obvious points on that? I mean, it's if you could do it, uh, and there's lots of complexity in doing it, uh, it's better in, I think, every way. I don't know that there's any cons to it, actually. Yeah, so if if you could, like, you know, whether it's Vitalik or Justin Drake or whatever, like any of the Ethereum uh, folks, I think if you ask them, like, if you could, you know, uh, snap your fingers and just turn ev- all staking into yeah. solo stakers. They'd want the they same. Would, they would be instantly, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you do that? Like, there's there's no downside. Like, half of Ethereum nodes are in the U.S. And most of those are in a single data center in the U.S., like, which really? is bananas. Like, something like, I think, close to a third of the Ethereum network is in U.S. East 1, which is Amazon, you know, an Amazon data center. Come on. Which is hilariously, like, 20 minutes away from the White House and the CIA headquarters. <laughs> it's, like, right there. I mean, I know it doesn't matter. It could be anywhere, but, like, it's just, there's something just so like aesthetically uh, unpleasant about that. Um, you know, and then there's a whole chunk in Europe in like a single data center. Now, why is that? It's not because people are like jerks and it's because it's you, you want to be where the other nodes are. It's yeah. uh, it, it's just, you get lower latency, you know, you're, right. you're going to get better performance. It's also cheaper and easier. Uh, there's lots of good reasons from the operator standpoint why you want to put a lot of nodes there. But uh, yeah, that's pretty scary. Like, you know, like a a backhoe digs a, a, a hole and like cuts the fiber line, like a third of Ethereum goes down. Like, kaboom. That, <laughs> uh, you know, that's not great. People always laugh at like Solana, like, haha, you know, it, you know, it goes down all the time. And uh, one point, Hertzner, you know, shut off Solana mining and, um, you know, like half the network went offline. I'm like, you know that could easily happen to Ethereum too, right? Like it's just it's just happenstance that it it hasn't. Uh, so solar staking is super important. So the EtherFi has an initiative which is actually tied to EtherFan, uh, which is called the Operation Solo Staker, where we are allowing people to basically get free hardware and use a staking income to pay for the hardware to run nodes. And so we Ooh, uh, we booted up a node in Guatemala. I think the first it was the first node and Ethereum node in Guatemala. And a bunch of others. Um, and so the idea is basically we're, we're sort of bringing together people who want to stake and solo operators and then a DVT provider, uh, Oval, that makes it sort of safe and secure um, to subsidize the hardware using staking income. So to from the perspective of the node operator, they're getting a free staking machine and uh, some meet the stake and a, a bit of a surplus income that they can use to pay for their, you know, internet connection and, and do whatever else. So, um, and so the connection here to EtherFan is that all the ETH that's staked through this EtherFan uh, NFT project goes to solo uh, operators. So it'll help decentralize Ethereum. So the idea of this NFT is that you can use it as your PFP, Twitter, or otherwise to demonstrate your commitment to Ethereum uh, decentralization. I love that. I love how you guys are getting on the like buy now, pay later game, sort of. <laughs> you know, it's like... You know, buy in with your uh, with your NFT, contribute to the network. We send you some hardware. You end up paying for it later. H- how do you send them the hardware? I guess you just sort of find their user and talk to them, and then get their address and fire them off yeah, the ASICs so, machine. It, yeah, for now it's an approval pro. We've had I think close to six hundred people apply uh, to be part of Operation Solo Staker to be node operators. So we vet them. We make sure they're legit. I mean, these are mostly like. I guess, high profile members of the Ethereum community. Of course. And the idea is they literally, they they get a free or effectively a free computer. So they get a DAP node or an Avado machine. We also give them shards of uh, uh, validator keys that they can use to run validators. So in exchange for getting this computer, this staking machine, they agree, okay, I'm going to run a validator for at least three years. And over the mm. course of those three years, part of the staking income goes back to pay off the machine. But from their perspective, it's free. And then they get to keep it afterwards, obviously. And uh, from our perspective, we're getting somebody, you know, a decentralized Ethereum node to stake our ETH. Uh, so it's a win-win across the board. I love that. Did you and the team term restaking? Like, was that a term before you guys? Yeah, it was. It, I want to say Eigenlayer, uh, Surya meant Eigenlayer was the one that coined it. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't know okay. if there was somebody else before that. Because you guys are huge on this. Yeah, yeah. We, we think... Um, 
Uh, you know, we actually just had like a, a Twitter space session with, with Sriram, the founder of Eigenlayer and Justin Drake. And I thought that was a phenomenal conversation about the, the pros and cons and risks associated with restaking and definitely fully aware and uh, understand the risks of it. But I also think the opportunities are pretty significant. And actually the benefit of restaking is that it makes being a solo node operator profitable. Like right now there's this, I would say incorrect belief that like to be a node operator and be profitable, you need to be running, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of validators. Uh, and so you need these big entities, these big companies that like that's their full-time project is to run uh, nodes. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think we can show through Operation Solar Staker and through Etherfan and Etherfy that you can actually profitably run, you know, just one or two validators. And with restaking, I actually think it becomes quite attractive. You know, someone could be making hundreds of dollars uh, a month or more just off of running this, uh, you know, Ethereum, uh, no, just a single validator. And then you, that means you can do that all over the world. Then, you know, yeah, you can have nodes everywhere without, uh, uh, you know, being concentrated in just a couple of data centers. It makes so much sense. If you don't mind, can you just go through the, the, the pros and cons very quickly? I know you said you had a Twitter spaces about that. Can you just give me the TLDR on that? Yeah. So maybe I'll start by explaining what restaking is at a very, very basic uh, level. The idea of restaking is that you you know, you have Ethereum nodes. In order to be an Ethereum node, uh, someone has to put up 32 ETH, $55,000 or whatever it is uh, these days. Yeah. Uh, in exchange for that, you get to run an Ethereum node that attests to blocks, that proposes blocks, and participates broadly in the Ethereum uh, consensus uh, mechanism. And the, your penalty, if you don't do it properly, if you double sign blocks or just generally kind of misbehave or you're offline, uh, is slashing which means you lose a part of that $50,000. So that ETH you put up, you put at stake is what gives you the right to run the server, but you know, you could get punished uh, if yeah. you do, do things improperly. You know, what if you could make that slashing mechanism programmable? Which is to say, what if you could allow those Ethereum nodes to validate or to perform other services and you know, to reach agreement that if a node is misbehaving and performing those other services, then you could programmatically slash their ETH. So now what that allows you to do is sort of broaden the Ethereum trust mechanism to other services. Those services could be oracles, could be a data availability layers, it could be a variety of other services that, uh, that run in tandem with the Ethereum network. It could be other blockchains you know, that uh, they are trying to spin up that want to benefit from the, this very broad Ethereum you know, consensus. So you know, there's a lot of risk associated with this because at a very basic level, you're kind of messing with the Ethereum monetary and incentive structure, right? That inherently has a lot of risk. I mean, this is a system that has hundreds of billions of dollars of value, you know, tens of billions of dollars staked to protect and secure this system. And, uh, you know, indirectly, even, even more than that, because of all the systems that kind of run on top of it. So anytime you mess with the incentive structure there, like there's, there's risks associated with it. And in particular, imagine that, uh, you know, some system that's been restaked, that's been validated, gets so big and it becomes such a large share of the effective value, I guess, on, on Ethereum that they can influence the social consensus of Ethereum. They can say, you know, if, if the system breaks down, they can go back and say, look, Ethereum has to fork to resolve this issue that, uh, that occurred. And this could be like a layer two on Ethereum that is benefiting from, let's say, a data availability layer uh, through restaking. Or it could be a variety of, of things. Um, and this was, you know, a, a, a blog post that, that Vitalik wrote. And then during the spaces that we had, Justin Drake expanded on it beyond that um, to talk about other risks associated with this uh, restaking model. And I think, as I said, all of those are valid risks, but I also think the opportunity uh, is significant. And the idea of further generalizing Ethereum to create this programmable layer of trust is quite powerful. And so, I mean, it's going to happen. So we may as well think about how to make it uh, secure, I guess, and and reduce the risk to Ethereum as a, as a whole. Any big events for the rest of the year for you guys? I mean, you guys are shipping things at a crazy rate. Um, obviously, you have your NFT project, which will be out by the time this episode goes live. You guys just sort of kicked off Operation Solo Staker. I know you guys announced phase one of mainnet on May the 3rd, almost a month ago. Anything else that's 
about to pop off over the next, we'll call it six months until we get into 2024? So the most exciting and important thing is Etherfan that I mentioned. I believe the plan is October-ish, I almost don't want to give a date, is when the actual liquid staking token, the EtherFi liquid staking token is going to uh, launch. But the most immediate thing that's happening is EtherFan. And that is this gamified staking project that builds on top of EtherFi, where users can mint profile, support Ethereum uh, decentralization, and get rewarded for staking. Then the longer you stake, the higher your rewards. So it's a, it's a really cool, uh, I think pretty unique uh, layer of gamification on top of ETH staking. I love that. Mike, what a treat. This has been a great episode. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, before we let you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and EtherFi online and on socials? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's ether.fi. Uh, and then if you want to look at uh, etherfan, then it's ether.fan. Super easy. I think on Twitter, we're ether underscore fi and ether underscore fans. Myself, I mean, that's probably the easiest way to, to find us. For, for me, I think I'm Mike Silagadza, but no one's going to know how to spell that. So just go to etherfi and uh, you know, go from there. <laughs> Go find you. Mike, really appreciate it, man. Truly a great episode. I got some homework to do. I need to level up my knowledge in regards to everything staking related, future aspects of ETH. And uh, of course, I'll be buzzing on Etherfy as well. I'll do my best to snag an NFT, but really appreciate you jumping on. Can't wait to have you on for round two. Good old Toronto homie coming on the show. We love to see that as well. Have fun down south. And uh, next time you're in the, in the big city, let me know. We'll, we'll grab dinner or something. Great. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me on. It was it was fun. Thanks a lot, Mike. Folks, what an episode with Mike Siligadze, co-founder and CEO of the one and only EtherFi. Huge shout out to Mike and his team for making this happen. Hope you enjoyed this episode, folks. I certainly did. If you guys did, please subscribe and show us some love. It would truly mean the world to my team and I. Speaking to the team, love you guys. Thank you so much for everything. Eustas, my amazing sound editor. Appreciate you as always. And to the listeners, love you guys. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.